jump straight into it. We're going to be doing questions, Q and A's, and I'm also going to be talking a little bit tonight about Facebook and the strategy that we're going to be using. Uh, it's 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 basically what I've been talking about in a few of the other hangouts, but I'm going to explain in a little bit more detail as to how exactly we're going to approach it. Um, so. First of all, David, what I'll do is I'll jump into that first, and I'll get I'll get that done, um, and then if you've got some questions after that, we'll go with that because it shouldn't take too long. Now, um, I'll just might do a bit of a screen share here to bring up the picture so we can see it. Um, let's bring that up there, and then I'll do the old screen share. Where is it here? There we go. So present to everybody, and it should be coming online right about now. Can you, can you tell me when you can see it, Dave? Can you see it yet? Yep, I can see that. Okay, excellent. All right, so basically what we've got here is the, the if we look on the left there, it says Banana Republic. They're just a, a, another company that are, that are advertising using Facebook ads, but they've been very successful, and Facebook are kind of profiling them as a way of saying, well, here's a, here's a sex story from, uh, you know, the way that our ads work, and if you want to have the same kind of success, then you should look at what we've done here, or these guys have done. So, it, it, what they're saying here at the bottom here is that they've had four times a return on their ad spend. So, obviously, if you can get your ads at 25% of the normal cost, that's a good thing. Uh, it says here the top channel for new customer acquisition during the holiday season. So. Um, they've done really well there. I don't know how they measure that, but um, it's, it's a good, again a good thing. And it says they're getting 60% higher click-through rates with look-alike audiences. So really what I'm going to explain here very quickly is, is the look-alike audience and how that's working for, or how, I'm already testing this, but how it works across the board and how you can use it if you want to do your own Facebook ads or if you want to join uh, the ads that I'm doing. So. Yeah, on the right here, I've just put here uh, student buyers, uh, st student subscribers, and what I've done is I've created two lists, and the the idea is that these these lists are going to they're, they're what we call custom audiences, and if you just go into Facebook and click on audiences, all you do is you create a custom audience. There's there's different choices for audiences, and you can you basically got a custom audience, a lookalike audience. Or uh, I'm just trying to remember what the name is, but it's it's like an area audience. So you create a an audience based around demographics, where they live, you know, what age they are, etc. And the idea is that first of all, what we do is we create a custom audience. In in this case, in, in the strategy that we're using, and and, our, and also the same strategy that Banana Republic used. If I just read this a little bit here, Banana Republic used lookalike audiences modeled after its most loyal customers to increase its customer base during the competitive holiday season. The result are uh, nearly four times higher than expected return on ad spend. So the idea is that they took their customers, their best customers, and said, all right, we want to find an audience like this. So what they did is they took their email addresses, they obviously collect them when they purchase, they put them into uh, a custom audience on Facebook, and then what they do is they use that custom audience to create a lookalike campaign. So they go out and find people who are like that audience. And the the power of this is that you need to have that audience to start with. You need to have an audience of people who are actually good customers to be able to, to, to find a lookalike. And the more of those you have, the, the, the more you're going to be able to build a quality lookalike. If you've got half a dozen students who are good students, you're not going to build a lookalike audience out of this. just not enough information. You've really got to have, that. they say, a minimum of 200, uh, but the more the better. So what I've done now is I've actually built, like I said, these two lists of buyers and subscribers. As subscribers, is it's over 10,000 people on that subscriber list. So what that means is that these are people who have subscribed to our email list. So they've come to our website and they've they've said, okay, I'm interested in learning more about G4, and they've given us their email address. So we've got, like I said, over 10,000 of those. What the buyers are, these are people who have either bought the G4 guitar method, so they've actually paid money, we know they're customers, or they're students who are enrolled with 
any of our teachers who, who I've managed to get the details from. Uh, and I, I still only have a small percentage of those. I probably have about 20% of the details across the network. But as I gather more information from you guys, um, just so you know how I got that 20% is that I go to our member site and every person who's registered on our student member site, I have, have their email address. I download that into a list to a CSV and then I import that into Facebook. So you guys have been telling your students, uh, you know, I know a lot of you have, uh, telling your students, hey, go here and you can join the G4 Guitar student member site because you're a paying student. And as we know, it's the old 80-20 rule, 80% won't do it, 20% will, and that's why I'm guessing that we've got about 20% of your students currently. But if you actually send me your students' email addresses, if you send me a list, I can put them in into the system. I'm not going to email them. All I'm going to do is put them onto a Facebook lookalike campaign or a Facebook custom audience, and then I can market ads in front of them, or I can uh, use them to build lookalike campaigns. So before I go any further, David, does that make sense to you so far? Yeah, it's it's basically um, finding the characteristics um, of people um, who who already have lessons, um, and maybe they like have children or whatever, and then targeting audiences who who are the same. Is that yeah. is that the general gist? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it it's it's a simple concept. Uh, and the idea is that you know Facebook have those the information about our students because anyone who uh, if we've got an email address it's, it's like they know everything about you that you've done on Facebook everything from pages that you've liked to uh, you know friends that you have to bands to books you've read anything that you've added to Facebook <clears throat> then the more information they have on you. So, yeah, so they can then make a profile of you and then when a lookalike campaign comes up, they match you to that campaign and go, okay, this guy fits the profile, he's very close to uh, an ideal student of G4, therefore we're going to put uh, ads in front of this guy because we're going to add him to the lookalike campaign. Makes cool. sense. Yep. <clears throat> All right, so so that's, that's basically... An, so, so we have the student subscribers and then we have the student buyers and obviously the student buyers are, are going to be much higher quality. These are people who actually spent money with us and we could even break that down again to it could be students who have been with us for a year or more and so you can imagine the quality of a lookalike list if you could get even a thousand, if we could get a thousand students who have been with G4 for, for a year or more then we have a really good profile of what those kind of people are. You know, we don't know exactly who they are, but Facebook will know who they are. We could work it out, I suppose. We did a lot of research, but they're doing it all for us. So they could work out that those people are between the ages of, uh, their, maybe their parents, and they're between the ages of 30 and, and, and 45. Uh, they have, uh, yeah, they earn a certain income. They've read these books. They've watched these videos. They like these movies, etc. So it's, uh, really very powerful if we can break it down. But we're just going to start with buyers and subscribers and then what I'm going to start doing is asking across the network if you can give me a list of people who, who have been with you for a, for at least a year uh, and then we can, we can even build a, a better quality list. So we end up with three lists, uh, high quality buyers and then subscribers. And so what this means for you guys is that if you... If you, you can do it within your own businesses, of course. You don't need to, to do what I'm doing, which is the done for you. But the, the point is of, of what I'm doing is, is I'm trying to collate all the data and the information because there's no way for me to transfer that information to you. It's only within my account. Uh, so I can't sort of give you a lookalike campaign. I wish I could, but, but unfortunately I can't. So it means that those as we get this right, and I'm still not at a point, and I'll say this, I'm still not at a point where I'm saying, hey, I'm going to get you lots of students by doing this. And we're not there yet. We're still putting this together. It's all still fairly new, and we're still testing it to some degree. But what we're really doing is narrowing down on the market and on who are the right students based on uh, the. And I want to see these look like campaigns work. I want to see the results 
once we've spent you know so many thousands of dollars and we can see the students are coming through we can see that we're getting uh, more uh, a high quality return so we're getting what these guys are talking about four times the return on spend and all that sort of thing then we know that we're starting to really uh, it's really working but we're not there yet and I'll make that point still very much in the testing phase okay um, Ben Akari, have you got any questions on that at all? Does it all make sense to you as well? Yeah, seems to make sense. Um, for the subscribers, do you yeah. automatically get all the ones that sign up on each of our websites? Yeah, it, I, I get them through... I, I've got those subscribers, if they come through on the Aweber, um, but I've got the... Um, also, the you're paying students because they come through, and if they subscribe to the member site, the problem is is that a lot of them won't. A lot of them, you'll tell them, "Hey, go and sign up to the member site," and they won't. They'll just yeah. keep turning up for lessons. Um, plus, you're going to get obviously inquiries who don't uh, come through the the, uh, the Aweber. They just simply uh, ring you up uh, from a flyer and those kind of things. So. By giving me the data um, that you have, then it helps me to build a more accurate. And you can imagine as we really collect this and, and we end up with, you know, tens of hundreds of thousands, if you like, even uh, over over the years, um, it builds and builds and builds till we really can narrow down uh, the quality. So the more information I get from you, and this is leveraging our network. This is what we're all about. We want to really leverage uh, G4 as a network so we can get the data and the information faster. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, so that's that. Um, so let's uh, jump into question time. Um, so David, have you got a question or a topic that you want to jump into tonight? This morning uh, for you? Yeah, I have a few questions, but I'll just give you the main one today. Um, okay. Is um, I have I think I might have posted about the student that I had this young student who. Who turned up with a guitar? Didn't turn up with a guitar. Didn't turn up with a folder one week, and <laughs> so. Um, I remember well. Yes. <laughs> they had um, they had a lesson. I think it was yeah, it was last week, and it was it was such a disaster. I just didn't. I, I usually never get stuck, but basically, the kid came, um, and um, and the and 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 I and I found out the dynamics of, of the relationship that the kid that the kid is fostered. So it's not the actual parents, and she didn't make that clear from from day one. You know that, you know she's only made that clear on week week four or week five. You know, yeah. Um, so so anyway, you know she she just she was getting so frustrated because I was I was asking about the practice, and she said, and 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 yeah, and she was and she was basically just just getting really well, not angry, but you know about me kind of pushing you know about the practice I, I wasn't I wasn't saying like you're you're such a bad guardian or, or whatever you know I was just trying to help her out and uh, so anyway then she turned around to the kid and he was going to go and see Father Christmas or something later that that day and, and, she, and she turned around and said to him like um, I think it was something like I'm going to tell like Father Christmas that you've not practiced guitar and you won't get presents and something. It was really horrible. So the kid just like burst out into tears and then wouldn't do the lesson. And then it was like she wouldn't take responsibility and she wanted me to step in. Um, so I, I, I didn't know what to do really, but I managed to speak to the kid and I managed to just get him into the room and sit down with the guitar, but he was just so hysterical that um, you know, and I was I was sat there, and I was just stuck for things to do. And I thought, well, I'm I'm a guitar teacher. I'm not his guardian, and that. So this is not for me to deal with, really. So I went and and I spoke to her about that, and uh, yeah. So I was just it's the only time in in my teaching that I've ever been stuck like that. You know, it was. I hope yeah, that kind yeah. of sounds like yeah, yeah. Well, you know uh, what I and I have said this a few times before is that. We, we need to be not too concerned about these rare cases, and, and we'll go into it, but we, we don't have to worry too much. You don't, you don't want to put too much energy. It's kind of like the 99-1 rule. Uh, you know, 99% of the time, this will never happen, but 1%, it'll, it'll happen to you. Uh, it, and it, it's, you know, if we're talking life and death, 
then yeah, we want to prepare for for worst case scenario. But if we're just talking about an occasional uh, unusual set of circumstances where uh, this you know we've got a child here who uh, it, it, who knows? I, 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 it's not for me to say. It's not for you to say. Of course, you, you've probably got a better idea than me. But it's certainly not for me to say uh, whether or not he has any emotional issues. I'm I'm sure being a foster you know under foster care, there are certain uh, challenges for both parent and the child, or the, the the carer and the child. So maybe it's more complex than we're used to. If if you're uh, getting this coming up a lot, if you live in an area where this is this is a common scenario, fostering children is is you, you know every fourth or fifth child is a fostered child. Then yeah, you need to learn how to how to work with it. You need to go and do some a course on it maybe or something to to really understand how to work with foster children and and you know children at risk and in need and, and so forth um, but, you know but if we if we look at it and and, and I give you my idea of, of you know what I've done in those cases because I have struck most scenarios over the years uh, not most of the time when you're running a music school this is the thing about what we do is that it's it is it's not meant we're not saying that it's this way or meant to be this way but it's just it is and that is that we're going to end up with students who are, are more uh, Privileged, if you like, you know, parents or, or people who are, who are struggling financially, guitar lessons or any music lessons tend to be a luxury. So you're not going to see a lot of those kind of kids turning up, unfortunately. But that's just the way it is. So we we don't get a lot of these at-risk children. You know, if you're teaching in certain schools where it's uh, you know, you're in an area. I had a teacher who worked for me. Uh, he was a great teacher, really, really nice guy. And uh, he was working in a school in the very western suburbs of Sydney, where uh, a lot of the kids were what we call at risk. Uh, and just just to def understand the term at risk, at risk are children who are in families where it's been recognised that their the ch child is likely to end up uh, involved in crime. Uh, or gangs or drugs, that, that's generally what they consider at risk. They can see the circumstances of a child, uh, they're at risk of ending up in you know, antisocial type situations. So the, the, anyway, he went out and worked in this, this school and he, he just said to me, Dave, you've got no idea. Uh, you know, where, you know, in our schools you end up with one in a hundred kids who, are, you know, at, at risk, let's say, uh, difficult to handle and and uh, a challenge on every level. Uh, he said it's the it's almost the opposite. You know, eighty percent of them are, are really difficult. These it's just these some of these kids are going in and out of uh, child detention and uh, turning back up after you know three months in some child detention centre and their their parents are ending you know in and out of jail and, and all this sort of stuff. It's really crazy what he was talking about, but but it goes on. We know there are certain areas where this sort of thing happens, so. What hap What do we do? And and it was good because he actually taught me a lot. He started telling me the kind of things you do. Um, you know, in these situations, the best that I can really offer you um, is to be very very patient and very understanding uh, for for the child and the, the the foster carer. You know, the the carer is obviously doing a good thing, trying to help in in whatever way possible. I don't know a lot about foster care. I do I, I do know one lady who does it uh, here in Cairns, and it's quite popular. Here in Cairns, or a lot of people do it, and they actually advertise around here because this area, it's uh, just an area. There, a lot of people come from the the indigenous areas where um, they have a lot of alcohol problems and, and so forth. So there are a lot of kids who are being put up, teenage pregnancies, so forth. So it does go on here. Um, but my the the way that I tended to do it was was try and make a connection with the child because. Often, what they're screaming out for is someone they can trust and someone who is not going to uh, fall into the, the the usual trap that that a lot of adults do of feeling that they need to uh, give the child or, or react, sorry, react to the child uh, negatively. Because what happens is that when a ch when a child is used to to being told that they're naughty or bad or whatever, they start to take on that personality and they start to believe that's who they are. And so therefore they they become, you know, kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, but they also have a, a, a kind of thing where they're looking for any 
a evidence to, to keep reinforcing that idea. So if you, if you say, you know, stop mucking around or you're always annoyed or always this or always that, so, something along those lines, then that just kind of reinforces their, their belief in themselves. So what we want to do is build their confidence. Uh, it, to me, it's the best strategy that you've got. Um, it won't always work. Um, there's no guarantees on it. Sometimes you do need to be a bit strict, um, but be strict with a confident type delivery in, in that you might say things like, you know, Josh, I know you're really good at this. Um, you know, you, you blew me away last week with the way that you, 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 you played that song or the way that you learned those chords. Man, you're just so, you, you're going to be amazing. You're really, you, you've got what it takes. All I need you to do is just stick with me and give me give me the attention and and to do some practice for me. If you can do that for me, uh, you know the, the sky's the limit. So that that's really all I ever did is is I built their confidence and did it work every time? No, uh, but it worked enough for me to be to be confident that was the best strategy. And I knew that that had I come down hard on them, uh, it, it it doesn't really work. That, that's the thing. Yeah. That sort of strategy doesn't work. I managed to. Um, I didn't have a lesson um, after his lesson, so I, I did let it overrun a bit just because because I wanted him to have his lesson. And mm -hmm. at the end, I did manage him to get. I did manage to um, to do some playing. And I was saying to him, like you were saying, I said, right. I said, I'm going to write a letter to Father Christmas to say how well you've done today. Um, you know, and then I give him a sticker at the end because he'd he'd sat down and did. He's only seven years old, so it's not you know he's only a youngster. Yeah. So I give him a sticker at the end and said, "Well done." You know, you sat down, and you did all the picking ex exercises, and you know, and and kind of left it in a in a positive way. Yeah, correct. Yeah, and being seven, you know, there's so much potential there. He, he you know, he's yeah. at an age where he can go either way. You know, he could turn out to be amazing, uh, or he could turn out to be a real, you know, real problem. Uh, but he's he he just needs someone who he can trust, who he belie believes in him, builds his confidence. I wouldn't even care that much if he doesn't progress. Uh, you know, when when I see a child who is is at this kind of point where they're, you know, they're not just a lazy child. They're not just a, a, a kind of a I won't say you know, lazy is not a good term because no child is really lazy. They just take advantage of situations. Um, but the the this is not a you know most children happy family or reasonably happy family. Things are okay. There's no real problem. They just you know they just don't want to do it. Um, they don't want to practice. Uh, so when we're talking about a child here who has had a rough time, uh, seven years old, maybe I don't know how long he's been in foster care and whether he stays there for how long, who knows what the scenario is. But if you can see the signs that this is a, a kid who needs help, then really what you want to do is take the approach that I'm just going to fill this kid up with lots of confidence. Okay, he may not practice that much at the moment. He, he may be forgetful. There may be a, a problem with keeping this organized. And you recognize those signs early. You could see that this is a child that's going to, that whether it's the child or the carer, you know, a combination of the two probably. So you're, you know, you're trying to get bring it all together, and you can see this is not like a normal situation. Then yeah, you may need to just be flexible uh, to try and, and it may you may be able to group them, you may not be able to group them straight away. There's there's always even though we talk things, it's, it's easy for me to to talk ideal, uh, but the real world is never ideal. Uh, what we need to do is make the best of the chaos. Uh, and try and get it within uh, the you know what we're trying to work with, uh, and that's really what it's about. It's about you know really I think a large amount of what we do is train train them how to learn. That's that's what you're going to do. That's really what you're going to spend your first year of of, of teaching them guitar is teaching them how to learn, not what to learn, but how to learn. And I, I think that's one of the big things that often gets missed, not just with you know, music teachers with school teachers, uh, they 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 don't spend enough time teaching children how to learn. And Doug Lomoff goes into this, and and you can see that with the the top teachers that he was studying, how they used techniques and they taught students things like hand signals and cues. Uh, you know, taught them how to how to do certain things, how to come into their classes, how to sit. 
the environment, all these things that they were being coached in to prepare them to learn. And that really is, to me, the secret to great teaching is teaching students how to learn and then they'll, learn that they'll basically be on automatic from there on. They'll, they'll learn once, it, once it's set up. If, if you're getting a lot of, from any student and, and just generally, if you're ever getting resistance or you're finding that they're not learning or they're not cooperating or they're not practicing or not doing this or that, it means the environment's not right. And a lot of the time, you know, I would say this to parents, but I would, let me see if I can say how I'd say, say it to parents. I would say to parents initially that environment is really important to their practice. So if, if, if you're not getting a result at home, if they're not practicing, there's a good chance that it's the environment. And so it's not you, it's the environment. And so what I want you to do is tell me when they're, when they're not practicing and we'll talk about it and see if there are ways to change the environment. And because environment is actually a, a very big predictor of outcomes, uh, not just for uh, you know learning guitar, uh, but for for everything for your whole life. Uh, your your environment is is ha plays the biggest impact on you out of anything. And we, we often don't consider our environment, but our environment is is very important. For instance, um, they've done these kinds of things with you know diet and putting on weight and all this sort of thing. But for example, if you don't buy any junk food any crap food and, and put and put it in your cupboards. If you leave, you make sure you never buy that, um, then the chances are you're not going to eat that stuff. Most of that food is comfort food and when you don't have it in your cupboards, even when you crave it, even if you're sitting there at whatever time of night and you want to go and grab a packet of chips or drink a can of coke or whatever it is that, that you do, if that stuff's not in the cupboard, then you go there and you, you might for, for a minute think, oh, I wish there was this there, but then you're over it and you, and you get on. And by not having those things in your environment, then you don't. And after a while, the, the habit and the craving fades. Uh, but as soon as you put that stuff in your cupboard again, the cravings come back and the habit starts to form. So it's, the environment makes a big difference to the way that people behave and their outcomes. So if we if we use the example here in terms of learning guitar and practicing, what is the right environment? Well, let me throw this at you guys. I might just sort of get a bit of input from you first. Um, so I'll start. I'll bring Ben into the conversation on this one. Ben, what what would you consider to be a couple of things to think about for a good environment for practicing at home? Are we just talking about your immediate physical surroundings? Any anything outside of yourself. So anything okay, well, you can possibly think of that's not you. Well, the easy start would be all the things we've got on our um, that poster. So something like a guitar stand, a specific area with a chair, footstool, music stand, folders there. As few kind of tasks between you and practicing as possible. So the tiniest thought, oh, I could practice now. You can already be doing it. Yeah. That's, that's the most important thing. Excellent. And then obviously things like not being disturbed, making yep. sure that if possible that there's someone there with you. If you're going to be kind of if they're under kind of 13 or something, you definitely want to make sure you've got someone there. Yep, yep. So basically, what we're saying here is, or what you're saying is that by doing just just a few of these things here, we increase the chances of the practice getting done, right? Yeah. Okay, so if the practice is not getting done, then what we want to start looking at is the environment. What we what we do, and it's still important to do, but what we tend to do, and what a lot of people do, is get caught up in the actual motivation. We we focus totally on the motivation and forget about the environment, and that's where I come back to that thing about you know don't buy the junk food, don't put it in your cupboards, and then you won't eat it. Uh, so the same applies here in that by creating the right environment for practice then it's more likely to get done. So things like reminders uh, of why you're practicing, like having a, a poster on the wall of this is my inspiration, the reason that I'm doing this is because uh, you know I was inspired by this particular guitarist. It, it could be even a friend, you know, it might be a friend who plays guitar, one of the kids you know, might have a friend at school that plays guitar, all right, get a picture of your friend or get a, the picture of your friend's guitar or anything that reminds you of why you decided to take up guitar. Keep those reminders coming and keep them fresh. So, so, so that's a part of environment. It could also be uh, negative factors as well. So things like 
you know, when do you try and practice what's going on in your house when you're practicing, uh, you know, someone blaring the TV or, uh, you know, do you have a sibling who keeps coming in your room? What's going on? Tell me about your, your environment. So that's, that's one of the things that I look for is to how to fix that problem um, is, is to look at the environment as much as I look at their internal mindset. Um, David, what can you throw into this environment? What would you add to? Oh, I don't think David, are you there? Looks like he's frozen up. No, okay. Are you still there, Ben? Just making sure that I got somebody here. Yep. Yep. Okay. Good. All right. Still there, Looks like David's frozen up. Okay. So. Uh, I think we've covered that one. So I'll just go on to you know, Ben. What do you want to talk about today? Um, I don't think I've got anything specific to talk about. I'm doing most of the thing that I'm doing that you'd probably be interested in is going through the timetable finally and trying to get some better stats on kind of dropout times. So I'm typing in. I'm going through my accounts from the start of kind of last year, so March, a year and a half ago. Yep. and just putting in every student who I've received some intro pay fees from and then trying to guess based on whether I got any group fees when they would have dropped out to get a vague idea of retention rates and length of time and things like that. Yeah. Okay, Hopefully cool, I'll, be getting, I'll be getting some stats and be able to give you something a bit more useful, especially for the next meeting with Emma. Yeah, okay, great. So with, with your stats... And, and I come back to, uh, you know, the idea, which is, um, you know, someone like Tim Ferriss, he, he, he talks about this a lot about getting your key indicators, but not, not getting too many, just getting a few that are going to make the difference. Because the problem is, is that even though sometimes getting more, more indicators and more data it can be helpful, we often get lazy on it. We don't do it. We just just becomes too complex, too much work for everything that you add to it uh, is another bit of data that you have to consider, which just makes it more and more complex. So what we want to do is just get a few things that are, that we can track easily and to give us an idea. So that's where I was sort of coming, I think I spoke about before, of co collecting, look at the students at the different points. And, and really the only points there are is the the inquiry, or the, so your marketing, getting from your marketing, what are you investing in marketing and what is the result, so the different marketing channels, and then the sale, how many of those inquiries actually convert to sales, and then going from the, uh, the intro for those who are paid, converting into the group, and then from there you can have markers, you know, as many as you like, but really the way I look at it is just, okay, I've enrolled them now, and we're going to, on the, you know, the new system that we'll have, we'll be able to track exactly how long each student stays for. Um, that'll be automatically tracked if you put in the right starting date. And the idea is that then you'll, you'll get averages. You'll be able to look at, okay, what's an average student worth? And, and then you, you can actually get a value and you can say, okay, well, an average student stays for this many weeks or this many days. And therefore... You, know, you can look at all your dropouts, for example, and or you can look at all your students across the board. And it, it gets a little bit difficult in the sense that you're going to have some students who have been with you for three months, so you don't know how long they're going to stay yet. You, you, don't have, have, you can't say. But what you can do is you can draw stats based on the other students, and you can say, how many of my students actually got past three months? And then you know... And then how many of them got to six months? And how many got to nine months? How many to 12 months? So then what you can do is you can do projections on those students. And you can say, okay, for, for a student who's at three months, I know that, you know, 60% will end up staying for, for two years. I know that 30% uh, will, will drop out after, you know, within a year. And I know 10% will drop out in the next month or something like that. So you can start to, to draw some conclusions. So if you start with the, the first part of the equation um, of just tracking the, each of those points that I said, and then as we collect the data through the other process of the software, then we can look at what your average student is actually staying for. Makes sense? Cool. Yeah. yeah, the main okay. thing I'm going back for is I'm, I'm categorizing the dropout. So 
mid intro didn't convert from intro first maybe month of group and then any other time during group yeah and obviously by okay. putting in a start and an end date I'll then be able to put in those details will I be able to put in the details to the FileMaker Pro yes you'll be able to put the date that they start and finish um, it doesn't have to be an automatically generated one we can backdate them and put in the ones that we've already got yeah, that's right. You can you can go and yeah, you can go and put in the, the dates of past students. And what we'll be doing is yeah, importing all your students. So even if now if on your spreadsheet, if you could make uh, a column for when the student first contacts you, so like a timestamp. Um, so if you want to note these down, the the when they first contact you, when they enroll for the intro, and when they drop out. They're the three dates that we need. Cool. And that's close enough to what I'll be having. The enrollment date is close enough to what I'll be having because I'm just recording when I got the first payment. So yeah. that'll be within a couple of days. Cool, yeah. I mean, the, the first number... Time. Yeah, the first number only matters for marketing because if you know when they first contacted you, let's say they contacted you in August, then as you go back through your marketing, you can go, well, how many inquiries did I get last year at this time of year? And you go, I got 30 inquiries August last year. This year, I've only got 20. What am I doing differently? That's why you want that number. It's a marketing number. The, the sales number is telling you, well, how, what's my percentage of conversion from inquiry to sale? Am I doing better this year to the last year? Things are getting worse, better, etc. And then your third number is yeah, really telling you uh, you know, how many of those converted, how good am I presenting my intros, what percentage. And you get those three numbers sorted, then, you know, and then we, you're just really focusing on your groups, longevity of your students. And that's a number that we can, we'll be, it'll be calculated anyway. We'll know the longevity of your students will, and we'll be able to compare it to other teachers as well um, because I'll be able to, I'll have access to your files, so I'll be able to go in and look at it and, and look at, okay, what's Ben's uh, overall, you know, result, what's he getting, and then and then I'll, I can even compile an overall from the whole network and sort of say, okay, take all the numbers across the board, what, what's the average? The average is that, you know, 40% of students are staying for two years, 60% are staying for a year, etc. And if you know you're under that number, then you've, got, you've probably got some things to work on. Cool. So just to list them off, first contact, enrollment, group conversion, just those three for now? Yeah, that's just those three numbers. That's all you need for now. Yep, cool. And that'll, that'll plug straight into the system. So. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Is it worth going back for all the first contacts or just doing that from now on? Because I'm uh, yeah, be able any, to work it out. Yeah, any past data you got will certainly be helpful. Um, just hang on one second. Um, yeah, well, I'll bring it up. What I'm currently doing is just paid students, whether they're current or past. I'm only putting them in if I got the intro. So I'm not putting any first contacts that didn't then enroll in. Obviously, I should for the marketing data, but this was more just for my student. I've got it in the, as a separate sheet in my timetable spreadsheet. Okay, yep. Yep. So well, just leave see, that as it is, keep putting those details in, but also have one that just lists every inquiry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you can, I mean, what you want is you want as much accurate data as you can. Uh, so, in other words, if you've got lots of inquiries from you know a year ago, let's say, uh, but you don't know what happened to those inquiries, whether or not they enrolled, you, you haven't got all the data, then you don't want it. You don't want that data. Um, you, and you really, you know, the idea is you kind of want to set a date where you know that you've got those three numbers, where you can accurately bring in those three numbers. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, what I'll do, um, I'll just do a little bit of a, hang on a sec here. Um, I'll just see if I can bring it up. I'll just show you. It, I'm finding it's helping to sort of bring you guys in and show you how it's progressing so I can get some feedback and also bring you guys into it. Um, can you tell me if you can see that yet? Yeah. Just, you can see it? Yep. Okay, cool. Yep. All, right. All right. So let's just have a look at it. Um, 
So um, I'm just going to go to contacts here. And so basically what I've got here is, uh, you know, again, the, the, the students are all here, but uh, if I, um, sorry, what was I going to talk about? The, okay, so the stats. So let me just go to the reports. Um, and I've changed a few things here. But what's, what's happening here, and that number will not be accurate because we've got to fix some of these numbers, but I've, I've got to just fix this out. But basically, if you look at the top line here, uh, Steve Hart, it says nine days, and you know, I'm putting an average of $3.30 there. Therefore, he's worth $30. And then you look at the next one. And by putting in a dropout date, uh, then you can see it says 146 days there for, for Riley Jack. Um, if I put a dropout date there, uh, then what happens is that number changes. So you can see that I've got three dates there. I've got the, the, the date over to the left here is the date that they joined. Um, that, sorry, they first contacted. It's the contact date, what we call timestamp. And then the first date here is the intro date. That's when they enrolled. It was their first lesson. And then the dropout date. That's when they drop out. So all makes sense? Yeah. Yeah. Is okay, there the timestamp just to order them well? Or are we also interested in the distant the length of time between that timestamp and the intro date? We, we it, it, that's an interesting number, but it's not that important. Um, we you know, might it, look at it if we start noticing trends, but that's not what we're recording it for. Yeah, we I mean you've got that data there and you might look at it further down the track as you sort of gather more and more information. You might be saying, you know, you can look at what the average time between when they first inquire uh, to when they actually enroll and you might find that you, and, and I, I keep that data for myself because I know that you know it takes around three three, four months before someone who first inquires with me shows any interest in actually signing up. So Yeah. Um, you can look at so the yes. uh, look right campaign as well and say, I only want to take uh, email addresses from people who, within 48 hours of contacting, had booked their intro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you, you can also, there's lots of other data you can pull from that, you know, as far as, okay, so if it takes a person, if someone doesn't enroll within two weeks, then they're probably not going to enroll. You might get that sort of statistic, right, just as an example. If they inquire and then they don't enroll within two weeks, they're probably not going to enroll without a follow-up. So then you know you need to follow up on those people, otherwise it's not going to work. And and that's where, you know, in the report section, you, you're going to have things here like uh, inquiries, and you can actually sort them. You can just have inquiries, take them to the next stage, interested to a prospect, and then the idea is that you can follow up on these, um, and that gives you a place to go to... to follow up on all your inquiries um, and move them through the different stages. The idea is that there's different stages there, inquiry, interested, prospect. So that, and you can even email all those people. You could take that list of inquiries and send them an email all at once. Um, okay, so um, I'm just going to show you something here as well. So what I've done now, um, worked out something which has been pretty cool. Um, and that is the, and I think we spoke about this before, about the separation between the timetable and the student card. And the problem with that was that if you go here, if I just go through the process just so you can see it. So let's create a new contact. The green up here is for creating a new contact. So I just click there. And then the first thing I get here is in the marketing unknown. Um, that'll automatically go in there. Um, but you want to try and put in what it actually is. So if you know where they've come from, and then you want to click on that, and then you know, put in there. Let's put in David here. And I'll just put. I don't know. I'm not going to guess your birthday, David. I'll just put you in 1980. Um, that what's that? Very close. 81. <laughs> ah, there you go. <laughs> um, so, so here we've got, and Ben, you were talking about this before, about having the, the relationship down here. Does that look like what yeah, you're looking that looks, for? Yeah, that looks much better for me because then you can say, this is theirs or this is the mother's, and you can choose the primary contact. Yeah, excellent. Okay, cool. So, and we've got the state and the zip there if you want to put those in. 
Um, and so, yeah, so I've got a student there, but if it turns out to be, you know, the mother, just click on mother and then put her name in there, uh, you know, and then an email address, phone number, Skype, etc. Uh, I'll just put something in there just to fill it in. Um, okay, so that's all there. And then what happens is that when we go over here, um, at the top here, then we go to the experience. So we, we want to say what they are. There is, you know, the second contact there, but then we go to experience. And so we say they're a senior student and starting at level one. And again, you remember that I created these. So when you're on junior, you'll get choice of seven. When you're on senior, you'll get a choice of uh, five. So you can't make a mistake, basically. Um, and then in there, you can put some comments, um, whatever you want to put in there. And then what you do is you go to the timetable and make an actual booking. So you find a time. So we're going to go to the timetable now. And then we're going to say, OK, uh, you know, so what do you, when you want to come and it says, look, I can come on Mondays. Um, all right, let's have a look at what times. And then I'll say, how about, uh, because I've got the teachers here, I know what time the teachers are available. So I'll say, how about 4.30 on the Monday? And he says, yes. So I click on here, and he will appear. If, sorry, if you look, you, you can't see this list. I know that doesn't show up for you guys, but when I click on the list, um, I can't actually see his name uh, there. So what I need to do is go back and to the contacts here, um, and I'll show you. Where it says status inquiry, uh, it will I'll actually go back into here. So where this the, the status is, I need to change that status from inquiry to booked or intro or current. So I'm just going to change it to booked there. And then I'll go to find time. And now when I go to the list here, his name will come up. So there I can put David on the timetable. So that there now, what I want to do is also put in this, the date. So if I know that David's going to start next Monday, then what I'm going to do is choose the 11th, uh, 30th or the 11th, and that's it, and I'm done. And you can see it changed to no there, which means that time's not available now. That automatically changes as soon as I choose a time. And then I can click on the little icon there, and that takes me straight to David's contact page. And from there, if I click on confirmation one there, then it automatically puts in the details based on the timetable. So now it's got uh, that he's coming. It's this is the email. This is the letter that they'll get that Monday the 30th of November at 4:30 p.m. and um, yep, David's name there, teacher's name there as well. So what it's doing is it's pulling this information from the timetable, um, and that's what that's what I wanted to do. That's a little bit of magic that I wanted to share with you. So now we don't actually have to put those in, it just pulls it based on what's on the timetable. Is that all cool. sounding good? Yeah. And you can just send that, that by, you just press send, David, and that goes to the, to the person. Yeah, yeah exactly. Person. Yeah, so so what I do is, at the top here there's a bunch of icons, but the, the uh, first icon there is like an email letter, and so if I click on that, it will automatically generate an email uh, to the person on the contact. So whoever I put Whatever email address I put as the first contact, that email will get sent to them. Um, and that's as simple as... Uh, do multiple emails, David, or choose from the options? Uh, it'll always send to the first email address, but I could easily put another button there where it goes to the second email address. So you could you could choose a second... If there's a second email address there and you want it to go to that, um, then, yeah, it's just a matter of changing the button. Um, is so, it yeah. possible to hover over and it would say who it was, or is, it, is that a bit too detailed? Over this, I can't, well, you know who it is because it's this person. It's the contact of this person. Well, I was thinking if you couldn't remember which one was which contact and you were thinking, I've got to send this to the mother, if you hover over, it could say the type that you've got in your in that first field. So it could be student, it could be parent. I don't in, know if that's... But uh, if you look at the card, can you see here it says contact mum, mother? Yep. Yep, so that's the person it's going to. I mean, when you're on the send email page, so you can't, because that's contact one, and if you had contact two, and then you said you can have the separate things, 
basically yeah. just doing the emails quickly from not an inquiry standpoint, just any other kind of. Uh, the, the thing is that you you wouldn't put logically you wouldn't put uh, you know if if someone if you get that kind of very odd person that says I'm the mum ring me uh, but I want you to send the email to the dad so to speak right which which yeah. which might happen um, then that's we're, the thing really, I've had a couple of times I was thinking about yeah if 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 you get that then yeah we can just create a second button but you're gonna know it I mean it's it's one of those things where you know you're going to be here, and then it, it doesn't really need to be here uh, because you already know. You know you, you already started from this point when you enrolled them, and then what? So the the scenario, which would be very unusual, but it would have to go something like, uh, okay, I'm booking in my son David, and he's this birthday, blah blah blah. I'm his mum. Um, my email address is this, and my phone number is this. But I want you to call me when you need to call. But I want you to email. Their confirmation to the dad. Um, it, that'd be an unusual scenario, um, but it, in the case of that, I mean, you could even simply put the dad's email address into the, the contact email address. But in most cases, what you're talking about is a is something. I would generally say to somebody if they're booking in, look, who's the contact? I just need their their name, their their phone number, and email address because that's who I'm going to send everything to. Um, if they start giving me kind of confusing ways of sending different things to different people, um, I would probably try not to do that. I would I wouldn't want to be uh, getting confused because I'm I'm going to forget anyway. Uh, you know, unless it's all documented and in the notes, you, and, and that's that becomes a situation where you're not really running your business effectively. It's like you know you know if you contact Amazon, um, they they're not you can't tell them look send the stuff to my mum, but email me, blah, blah, blah. They, they do have different things set up, but if you start giving them all these kind of special details about, you know, this and that, it's not going to work. And and that's, most people are used to that, so it should be okay. David, uh, just another quick question. Yep. yep, David, go. Uh, yep. When I, use, when I use MailChimp, I send all the confirmations through MailChimp, and on MailChimp, you ha there's like a little tracker thing to see if the email's been delivered or if they've opened the email. Um, yeah. It, would you have a similar thing on this? Um, I think there's a, you can do that. Um, I think you can do it on any email, really. I think Gmail have a um, thing that you can add to it. Uh, but in most, in you know, in most cases with a confirmation, um, it's a little bit different. Uh, if you're emailing people in in terms of marketing, and you kind of want to track things and, and what's going on. I understand, um, but yeah, there are tools that can do it. Um, this particular program itself doesn't have it, but your email service should have stuff like that. So what? Because remember, the, the, what it does is it still does an email. It still goes out of this program to whatever your email server is. In this case, I'm using MacMail, um, so MacMail has tools that allow you to do that. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah cool. Um, it's probably not. I mean, I don't think it's that necessary because you've just booked someone in over the phone. Um, and I really think what you want to do is get to the point where people pay you over the phone. So it's not a case of sending them a, a bill. It's actually grabbing their credit card number over the phone and processing it there and then. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so that that first confirmation email, like I said, it, it actually pulls the, the information straight from the, the timetable. So that makes that easy. Um, but in the case of the second one, when they go to a group, it's a little bit different. And so when they join a group, what you're wanting to do here is they've got well, you've got a second confirmation here, which allows you to then put in the details. So the first one is where, it, like I said, pulls it from the timetable, and the second one is actually flexible. So you've got it. You can actually choose the date. So I could put in a date here, and then you can choose the time. So that, that's kind of like a, a manual way of doing it if you want to put in the date and the time. Make sense? Yep. yep cool. All right. So, um, yeah, any other questions on this? I've just one other thing I've added here so you can see is the ultimate song list. Um, so, for instance, here, uh, um, let me actually, I've got one already. I'll go to. So you can see here that you know there's 
the song title, uh, the artist, and then what I can actually do, you can see where it says links here. Um, if I go, if I, you know, any of those songs, if I click on it and then click here, it takes me to the main list. And then what I can do is I can put a link in there um, to, you know, wherever. Let's just say it's a, a link to something. And then you see this little icon appear, and that means that that'll give me a link to whatever. It could be the song, it could be the tab. Uh, whatever I like, and I can add in some notes there if I want to say link one is tab or, or this or that. Um, and then when I go back to their card, then that link is also there now. So I've got their ultimate song list here, and then I've got links, and it'll create two links. So if I, again, if I go back to that um, and put something else in there, it creates a second link, and then you can see I've got two links there. So each song can have two links. So one could be a recording this song, the other could be tab, and it just gives you a nice way to have that ultimate song list. But what it does is that as you build this, then when you go here, then you've got all the songs from every student. Okay, does that make sense? Don't want to lose you here. Um, ben Arkady, can you see? Can you are you with me? Yep, I can. I can also see yeah. that. Yeah, ben. Okay, so. Get that's kind of what, you know, and I know, Ben, you were talking about that. So y you imagine here you've got all your students' uh, ultimate songs together on one list, um, and then you can sort it. And so then you can start to see, oh, I've got, you know, 10 copies of this one song here, you know, Metallica. So a lot of people like Metallica. All right. So that that's something that you can keep in mind. So you can build this list out um, with all your students, and you'll start to get a really good idea. And again, we, you could export that data to to me, and or I can. You don't have to export it. I can actually export it out of your uh, actual databases and bring it all together under one. And then I've got a whole list of all the songs from all the students, and we can just compile it, bang, really quickly. So you can see the power of this. It's it's you know it's we're, we're going to start off with the basics, but. You know there are many many things it can do, but I just want to get the main thing of working. So at the moment we've got the 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 contact card here. We've got notes that we can add in. All this is sortable. Uh, you know in every every single one of these sorting your songs, sorting by the artist, etc. Um, you've got your practice log record here, um, drawing uh, you know averages and so forth there. Um, and again we can draw down on more stats. Uh, you've got your confirmation emails. You can, you know, easily make up certificates. Um, you can, you know, do gift vouchers. And if you want, like I said, just drag a picture in there, and you can have whatever you want there—a picture of a guitar or a guitarist. Um, and then you've got reports, and then of course the timetable has always been the main thing for me. This is really what got me uh, wanting to do this in the first place. And it's just the ability to really manipulate and see the timetable very quickly. And get to you know look at a particular day, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, any other questions or comments? Are we looking good? Uh, when when do you plan on having this up and running, David? Is it soon or in the future? Or? Yeah, it's it's sort of not far off from being ready. Um, but the the main thing which I mentioned uh, before was that. I've got to wait till I get to Japan, um, so January, um, because I've got to get it onto a server um, that's operating 24/7. Because you guys have got to be able to access it, because it'll be on a server. If 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 I don't if you know if I set it up now and I say, hey guys, it's going to be down for the next couple of weeks while I move to Japan, uh, you guys won't have access to your timetables um, or any of your data. So, and what I need there needs to be a beta period as well, so that we test it. Uh, to make sure you don't lose all your data, it doesn't collapse. Um, these things and these things will happen. Um, it's inevitable when you first get them. When you're first testing, things will go wrong, um, and so it's got to be a, a case of just picking a couple of you to test it with, and not not sort of putting in all your valuable data and, and worrying about it being lost. It's got to be something you've got to be willing to just trial. So you're keeping two things: you're doing what you normally do, plus you're doing this. So it'll be a little bit of extra work for those who do come on board. Um, initially, but then once we've sort of ironed out the bugs, then we'll be ready to go. And I've really sort of, there's a lot more obviously that I can do with it. Um, you know, the potential is huge, but 
I've decided that this is it. I'm just I'm not going to add any more features to it. I'm just going to work with what we've got um, and make sure it's solid. And then we're going to have a look at look at it. Uh, you know, making upgrades later. And this will be a, a situation where, uh, you know, when we do an upgrade, and this is the the thing that I'm working with at the moment, is that all the data needs to be exported and imported. So in other words, when I work on the master file uh, and make improvements to it then all the data has to come out of uh, your current setup and it's in lots of different tables and so forth. It's like having, if you can imagine you've got like 25 Excel sheets that are all linked in uh, on you know, interconnecting relationships. It's very complex uh, when you get behind the scenes. Uh, but the, the idea is that with all that, it, it all has to be exported and then it all has to be imported in, into the new file and that all has to be done pretty quickly uh, so you guys aren't, so, you know, don't say I'm going to take a week to, uh, you know, you won't have your file for a week. Um, it's got to be something that I do, that I can do through scripting. Uh, and so scripting, it means that it'll happen automatically. I just press a button and the whole process happens where it all downloads, it all uploads. So so I've just got, that's that's the main challenge at the moment that I'm working through. But I'll get there. It'll just take a bit of time. So. Okay. All right, cool. And I'm, I'm, this is great because by showing you guys, I can sort of get some feedback, some ideas on, you know, it, it, I don't mind you throwing ideas up. It, it's just a lot of the, like things like the checklist, they're not going to go on yet. Um, but I can, um, just by sort of going through with you, if you've got any ideas, yeah, for sure, and I just jot them down as ideas. They just won't be, it's not like the, the G4 method where we're able to add things and make things quickly. This is a bigger job. Um, so, and I want to get it to you uh, because a lot of the ideas just mean, you know, if we, we went out of the checklist, then I'd have to say, to you, well, that's going to add another six weeks to it while we work out how to put it all together because we've got to consider all the levels, all the things that need to be ticked off and um, build all the relationships and, and it just builds out the complexity even more um, and creates more risk of things going wrong. Speaking of risk and things going wrong, I was just thinking, do we need to worry about data protection for this? Do we need to have very strong encryptions and stuff? It's all encrypted, so uh, yeah, you you, you covered the on only that yeah only you're fully covered. The only way people will get, um, in fact, this is safer than uh, a website. So when you you know you see those websites where you enter your data or you use the website, something like QuickBooks, right? QuickBooks is actually less safe than what this is. Um, this is run by remote, so it, it's it's held on the server that I have. You'll have access via your password. As with anything, it's just whether or not someone gets access to your password, your, your username and password. But the, here's the thing is that they um, they also have to get the IP address, because what you do is you, you connect to the IP, um, and then you put in your, um, your username and password. And if uh, you know, you know somehow it's been at risk, we can quite quickly change that. It's no problem. Uh, but, you know, it's like anything. If you give up your username and password and someone manages to get the IP, they've got all of it, then yes, you're at risk. Um, cool. But even so, um, there are still layers that we can create where uh, they, you know, you can log in as a manager, then we can have a login as a... In, in other words, you guys won't have access to getting behind the scenes of it, so you can't damage it. Um, all you'll do is you, you might upset your data. Um, I can even set it up so you can't delete any of your data, and and that might mean just uh, you know having it so it's not um, like purging it basically instead of deleting it. So we can do things like that, but it just depends on uh, where we're at. But initially, yeah, it shouldn't be shouldn't be a problem. One thing that would be cool, I don't know if it's already there. Do we have an undo yep. button? Mm -mm. Not yet, no. The, the What happens is that when you try and delete uh, something on here, it'll prompt you, um, but once you delete it, it's deleted. But if you say to me, oops, I deleted something that was really valuable and I need to get it back, I've got a backup. So, awesome. Uh, yeah, backs up, backs up daily. Uh, but the thing is, you know, if, if you, let's say you put a, a new student up, this is kind of worst case scenario, you get a new student, you put all their details in there, and then you, you accidentally delete them. And to do that, it, it's a couple of steps to delete them. In other words, you've got to go behind the scenes uh, of the program, and then you've got to go to delete, and then you've got to click 
confirm, delete. So you've got to go through those three steps to actually delete a person's card. So it's possible, but the, you, you would have to do on the day, they would have to have been before it's backed up, and it would have been, you had to go through those three steps. So it's more likely if someone who gets into your program, maybe someone's working for you, they delete it and do it maliciously. Um, that's that's a scenario that could happen, but it's, it's only if you put in the data that day and it hasn't been backed up uh, in time. In other words, you're going to get the day before, you're not going to get t today's data. So. You have to be trying to make a mistake. You, you would have to really try, yeah. Um, and, you know, if you, I think in most cases it's, it's you're going to have that buffer anyway. It's going to be like, oh, I deleted a contact that I didn't mean, mean to delete. Uh, and then, all right, you know, it's someone that, that was, has been in there for a week or a month or a year. It's, not, it's, it's very unlikely you delete in the first place and even more unlikely someone that you just put in that day before it was backed up. Yeah. So yeah, see we can put we can put in like undo buttons and all that sort of thing, um, but it's it's going to take a lot more work because Deleting everything all that confirm delete stuff that should be just as good. It should be yeah yeah and it, and it's pretty safe, um, you know, yeah it should be fine and I think I think if if we see there's a problem and these are the things of the beta testing if we can see where there's problems and we'll put in uh, things like that. Um, but I know it can be done, so it, it's something that I'll probably add later. But I'm just not going. I'm not urgently adding it because it's not. Yeah, it's one of those things that no, takes a lot of work, but it's not necessarily um, going to make a big difference. Cool. Cool. Excellent. Um, yeah. Anything else before we sign off? I'm good. Excellent. Um, All right. I would like to send you a couple of videos, David. Do you remember we were talking about the uh, the young group, the two group of two young boys? Oh, I was yeah. having some trouble. We were talking about the discipline and stuff. I have now left it probably a bit late for this because I haven't shared the videos with you yet. But would it be possible if I shared the past four with you and then just sometime over the next month, two months, three months, you get an idea? Because obviously I'm not expecting instant response to help me with it now. I don't think it's on the verge of blowing up or anything. It seems fine. Not ideal, but I think it's okay. It'd be great if you could just watch those four, because the first one is chaos, and then the next three are fine. But I'd like to see what you'd say would be the next step to make it better. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you're you're putting them up on YouTube. And they're on Google Drive. So would that be a fine way to share it with you? Um, I'm not sure. Does it have the feature of you know, speeding it up just because it's we're talking what four half an hour lessons. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, because so two hours weird. of video plus you know time taking notes and all that. We're talking like three hours. Uh, it's it's quite a bit of time to to get through them. So if you can get me the highlights or you can sort of pick out the minutes that you want me to watch, um, that would be much better because it's it's a lot of time to be sitting there watching. Uh, video. I don't. I don't mind watching uh, one because remember that I get videos from lots of different teachers, so I'm watching videos all the time. So if you can give me, even if you give me um, the first one and the last one, and I can sort of work through it and have a look. Um, and I'm just being honest with you because otherwise I'm going to scat through it anyway, and I'm just going to look for the main things because in most cases I can pick up on the things pretty quickly. I don't need to analyze every minute of a video. I can see the dynamics that are going on. Um, I can see the problems. Usually within a few minutes, I can start to see what's going on. So, um, so if you you're welcome to send me the four videos, but if you want to send me the first one uh, first, maybe that's the a better idea. I can I can have a look at that and I can give you an assessment of my idea, and you can just see if that matches with you. And then based on my comments, you can come back to me with another video and say, well, this is how it looks now. Um, what do you think? Sound good? We're getting all blocked out here. Um, David, can you still hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Looks like Ben's, Ben's dropped out. All right. Well, we'll, we'll end it there anyway because we are a bit over time. Um, so, yeah, thanks, Dave, and um, I'll see you um, next week, hopefully. Okay. All right. See you later. Have a good one. See you. Bye. Bye.